Greetings in the name of Jesus and welcome to Riverside Tabernacle this Sunday morning. I'm Pastor Simon and it's my honor to share God's word with you again. I trust you will find this message inspiring and uplifting and I believe it will make a difference in your life. May you be receptive to the voice of the blessed Holy Spirit this morning. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we ask you for your blessings upon this, your word. We ask you, Holy Spirit, for enlightenment and understanding. Help us, O Lord, to understand your word and to live by your word so that we might please you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Once more, greetings in the name of Jesus and welcome again to Riverside Tabernacle. Today's message, if you've seen the banner that I've sent around, is called your move king jesus and i want you to listen to this very carefully because there's a great message in what we are going to talk about today god had laid this on my heart and i've preached the, this sermon a few times over the last 20 years but today it's just taken a totally different slant and i want you to really enjoy this new look at this sermon the word of god is uh, is taken today from Genesis chapter 22 verses 6 to 8 and it's about the sacrifice that Abraham was about to make the sacrifice of Isaac and the word of God reads and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac and he took in his hand the fire and the knife so they went both of them together and Isaac said to his father Abraham my father and he said, Yeah, I am my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. Life is neither easy nor fair. We are in a constant battle for our souls. And one feels as if you are thrust into a weird computer game playing for your life to me it's more like a game of chess there are different pieces on the board and each piece represents a different person that plays a role in your life and the king represents jesus and once he is removed from the game once he is removed from the board once he is removed from your life the game is over you are playing against the devil and the prize is for your soul. The prize is your soul. If you lose, the devil gets your soul. Now the devil is a better chess player than most of us. And his strategy is simple. It is the same strategy that we use in chess. Get the king out of the game and the game is over. And the devil's strategy is get the king out of your life and he wins your soul. As I said, he's good. But he's not the best. King Jesus is the champion. And today he's offering to play your game for you. He's offering to play in your place. He's the best. And he has all the winning moves. Today in the sermon I'm going to take you through five simple stories from the Bible. And I will show you just how great a player Jesus is. And then you decide if you want to let him play your game. If you are willing to say your move, King Jesus. The first story is the story of David, and I call it Knight in Shiny Armor. Israel was in a war they couldn't win. Saul had no answer to the Philistines. In fact, Saul had, was no answer to the Philistines. Saul had no more moves left. And him and his army stood on one side of of the valley and the Philistines were on the other side and Saul had no more moves and Saul didn't know what to do his heart was in his hand he was anxious he was worried because the, the Philistines were calling out for a champion from the Israel, Israelites to fight their champion Goliath and Saul had no answer Saul had no moves the battle was lost the Israelites knew that the battle was lost until David came into on the scene and he destroyed the mighty Philistine Goliath with a little 
stone, a little stone. Goliath was the Philistine champion. David was God's knight who took out their king. Game over. Now the knight is a piece on the chessboard for those of you who play chess. And David was given the role of God's knight. And God made that move. And God's knight killed the Goliath who was the Philistine champion. David said in Psalms 27, 3, Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. And this he wrote to, to speak about that incident where he killed a giant. Though an army was against him and he was all alone, one little boy against the army, against the mighty Philistines, against the mighty Goliath, who was about nine feet tall, who called David a dog, and all David did was sling a little rock, a little stone, and win the, win the battle and rout the enemy. Saul's mindset was to look for a man to step in. David's mindset was to look at God to step in. And the flying rock in the story, that flying stone, is a picture of Jesus destroying the empire of Antichrist on his return as prophesied by the prophet Daniel. If you remember the, the king's dream and how a little a, a rock was cut out from the mountainside, but not with human hands. And this rock smashed the feet and of the statue and the statue disintegrated. You see, God has a winning move. And when God sends his rock called Jesus into our lives, no devil, no empire, nothing can stand against you. And David knew that. And David threw a, a little stone. But that stone reminds me of the great rock that is Jesus. When the Israelites had no hope, the rock of ages stepped in. When you are surrounded by enemies, do not fear. When you are surrounded by a situation, when you are surrounded by all the adverse circumstances that we face in this, in this life that we are living right now, with all the diseases and all the pain and the suffering and the crime, know this, the rock of ages was cleft for you. Hide in the rock. And that rock will step in. Your Lord God will step in. Look to the rock of your salvation. He wants to make a move in your life. Hand the game to Jesus today. Say your move, King Jesus. The second story I want to talk about is the queen of the castle. Again, the queen is a, is a piece on the chessboard. And the castle is as, as well. But I want to talk about the queen and I want to talk about Esther. Esther was a young Jewish girl. Hadassah, Hadassah was her Jewish name. She had no aspirations to be a queen. Her aspirations was to just live as a Jewish girl and maybe marry and have children. But God destined her to deliver her people from the armies of Persia. God knew Satan's plot to destroy his people long before Haman himself knew. Haman was the person who would try to destroy the Jews. But God knew that plot long before Haman was even born. And God moved his queen, Queen Esther, into position to end Haman's game. God moved Esther into the castle. God moved his queen into position. So when Haman's game started, Haman's game ended. Haman found himself fighting the Lord, not the Jews. He thought he was fighting the Jews. He thought he was fighting Mordecai, but he instead found himself fighting against the Lord God of all the armies of heaven, the Lord himself, Jesus Christ. His, his wife, Haman's wife, warned him. She said, it's futile to fight against the Jews. It's futile to fight against Mordecai because you will lose. But Haman boasted that he was close to the king. He thought he was because he was second in charge of that country. Because he was so close to the king. He thought he had everything and he could defeat the Jews. He didn't know that he might have been close to the king, Artaxerxes. But Esther was close 
to the king who mattered, the king of kings, Jesus is his name. Esther was close to the mighty king, the king of kings, and Haman lost his game. The Jews were to be exterminated. It was going to be a holocaust. Haman was the forerunner of Hitler. He was in the made from the same mold. In fact, there are some people who have, who have traced the lineage of Hitler and say that Hitler could probably have come from the, from the lineage of Haman. And the Jews were to be exterminated by this man. He had a decree by the king with the king's seal on it. But God made his winning move. Haman didn't count on Jesus playing the game for Esther. Esther handed the game to Jesus and Satan lost. Instead of Mordecai hanging on the 23 meter high gallows, it was Haman himself who hung there for all the world to see that the king of kings is no one to go against. Mordecai didn't hang. Mordecai became the prime minister. Haman became food for the birds. God had placed a key piece in a key position for a key move to win a key game. I hope you got that. God had placed a key piece in a key position for a key move to win a key game. That is what God is doing with you today. God has moved you into a position to make a key move because you're a key position in the game of life. And you're a key position in God's eyes. I mean, key person or a piece in God's eyes. And when the time is right, God will use you and make his move. It might not look like a significant place to be at right now. But just wait until it's time for God to move you and see what a move that will be. Don't ever think that you're in a place and it's unhappy. It's, it's not what you intended. God has moved you into that position. Stay there. Wait for God to move you and make his winning move with you. Allow God to move you. Say to God, your move, King Jesus. The third piece I want to talk about is the pawn. The pawn is a rather humble piece on the chessboard. The eight pawns in the chessboard and they all and they just move one step at a time and they go forward except, except for the initial step, which is a, is a double step. But a pawn is nothing really on a board. In fact, when we refer to people that are being used by others, we say they are pawns, but not in, not in the sight of God. In the sight of God, the pawn can be transformed. And today I want to talk about dead pawn transformed. Dead pawn transformed. When the pawn reaches the other end of the board, and if he has not been cut down by another piece, the pawn can transform into any piece that he wants to be, except the king. Lazarus in, in the book of John chapter 11 was dead for four days. All hope was gone. The Jews believed that for three days, the spirit of the departed would hang around just in case. That's what they believed. But four days, all hope was gone. The situation was dead. The sisters, my Mary and Martha, were adjusting to life without Lazarus. And then Jesus arrived. Too late. Too late, Lord. Too late. That's what they thought. They even told him, if only you had been here earlier. If only you had come while he was alive. You would have saved him. We may have situations like that. Situations that are not just dead, they way past dead. They've gone. A deadline that you missed, you can't, rec you can't recover it. An opportunity that is lost, never to be regained. If only we could turn back the clock, we think. If only we could transform that situation. But I want to tell you today, as a child of God, listen to this from a servant of God, a person who knows and have seen it. It is never too late with Jesus. Jesus is unaffected by time. God lives outside time and space and height and depth and length and breadth. God lives outside. He created time for our benefit. He does. He's not affected by time. He can transform the worst situation to the best opportunity. Jesus might arrive late by man's clock, 
but by God's clock, he is always in on time. You know, the saying go goes, God is never late. He is sometimes early, but he's always on time. Jesus was declared, uh, Lazarus was declared dead. He was buried. But Jesus spoke to his soul beyond the grave. And he told his soul to get back into that body. He told that body to regenerate itself, transform itself and come out of the tomb. And Lazarus walked out of the tomb, even though he was bound. His, his eyes were bound with bandages, but still he walked. How did he know which way to walk? He walked the way that he, when he followed Jesus' voice. When Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, Lazarus got up into his transformed body and he walked straight out. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. The game is not over until God says it's over. The game is not over until God says it's over. Mary and Martha were not short, sure of what to expect when Jesus came. When Jesus said, where have you laid him? In other words, Jesus said, take me there. I want to see the grave. They didn't know what to expect. They didn't know what Jesus was asking. But they were surely glad that they allowed Jesus to play their game. Death was looking on. Death thought he had won the game. And Lazarus was dead. But King Jesus still had to make his move. And what a winning move it was. The sisters knew their king. And that is why they said in their hearts, your move, King Jesus. Going on to the fourth story, I call it the bishop's sacrifice. The bishop is another piece on the, on the chessboard. It's a priest that's on the chessboard. And it, and it is an important piece on the chessboard. And I want to talk about Abraham today. And Abraham and his son Isaac walked up a hill to make a sacrifice to the Lord. And that is the passage I read today. Abraham took his son Isaac. He took two of his servants and they walked. And when they came to about three days away from the hill where they were going to make the sacrifice, Abraham said to the servants, you wait here. The boy and I will go and sacrifice. And it was a funny sacrifice. There was something odd about it because they had the wood. They had the fire, but they had no lamb. And Isaac asked his father, he said, we have the wood, father. We have the fire, father. But where is the lamb? And Abraham said those words. He said, God himself shall provide a lamb for the sacrifice. Isaac might have known. He might not have known. But he was to be the sacrifice. Isaac, the only son of Abraham, was going to be sacrificed. Yes, I know Abraham had Ishmael as well, but Isaac was the chosen son and he was the son of Abraham and Sarah. Isaac was tied up to the wood or he was tied down to the wood and Abraham, the bishop, raised his knife into the air. And as the knife arced towards Isaac's neck to kill him, God made his move. God made his move and he stepped in and he said, stop. And Isaac's life was spared. Isaac's life was spared. And I want you to remember that, that God spared Isaac's life. God provided a ram for the sacrifice. When, I, when, when Abraham looked up, he found a ram that was caught by its horns, by its head, in a thicket, in, in, a, in a bush of thorns. And he, and he used that as the sacrifice. And Isaac lived on to father the Jewish nation for out of his loins came the Jewish nation that God promised Abraham as his kindred. When God saw Abraham was prepared to let go of his best, God gave Abraham his best and his best was blessed into Abraham's life. What would you have done were you in Abraham's sandals that day? Would you have sacrificed your son? Or would you have said, no, Lord, not my son, anything else but my son. I would sacrifice all my bulls. I will sacrifice anything else but not my son. Abraham didn't lose Isaac that day for his obedience. He gained God's trust. And you know that in the Bible, 
Abraham is called the friend of God. God called Abraham my friend. Can you believe that? Can you imagine that? Because Abraham was prepared to let go his son, God called him my friend. Genesis 22, 14 says, very important. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Abraham could have said, the Lord has provided. Because that is what God did. God provided a ram for the sacrifice. But why did Abraham say the Lord will provide for himself a sacrifice? You see, Abraham was prophesying that day that on that same hill where he stood, where he, tried to, where he wanted to sacrifice Isaac, God was going to provide a lamb for the sins of the world. God was going to prophesy. A God was going to provide a lamb for the sins of the world. Abraham might have known that. He might not have known what the prophecy meant. And obedience is better than sacrifice. Abraham's obedience pointed to the greatest sacrifice to come. The crucifixion of the King of Kings, King Jesus. Abraham's obedience in sacrificing or being prepared to sacrifice Isaac pointed to God's willingness to sacrifice his own son and his only son on the cross at Golgotha. Abraham didn't fully know what his prophecy meant, but we know, we know what it meant. It meant that on that same hill, God was going to make his winning move 2,000 years later. King Jesus, it's your move. The last story I want to talk about is this king is sacrificed. The king is sacrificed. 2,000 years after Isaac carried the wood and walked up that hill to the sacrifice. Another Jewish son walked up that same hill. But he walked alone. His father wasn't with him. And instead of the wood, he carried a wooden cross. His name was Jesus. When Isaac asked his father, where is the lamb? Abraham said, God will provide. When Jesus said, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. God was silent. God never said a word. God never said a word. As Isaac was tied to the wood, Jesus was nailed to the cross. This time, there was no ram caught by its head in the thicket. This time, it was Jesus caught in a crown of thorns around his head. The Lamb of God had to die for the sins of the world. There was no turning back. There was no intervention by God. Jesus was the Lamb that Abraham had prophesied that God would provide. This time, God allowed the knife to fall. The sacrifice was made. God hid his face as his son was slain. The Bible says that there was darkness over the earth as Jesus died. God couldn't bear to see his son on that cross with all the sin of the world, past, present and future, dying as a lamb was slain. This was the ultimate sacrifice. And I need you to think about it today. It was the ultimate sacrifice God dying for men by the hand of men. This was Jesus' move by which he saved the world. The king was sacrificed, but not for long. Thank God, not for long. Praise God, not for long. The king was sacrificed, but not for long. When Satan and his cohorts were rejoicing, believing that the king was dead, and evil had won the game. Jesus made his final move. He rose from the dead. Praise his name today. Praise his name where you are right now. Just say amen. Type an amen. Smash a like. 
when Jesus made his final move on the cross, he rose from the dead. Satan could not believe it. The priests tried to hide it. The atheists refused to believe it. Sinners tried to avoid it. But Jesus had one more move. The ultimate move. The destruction of death. And the gift of life. Resurrected life. Praise his mighty name. I want to close with a story that I've used before. It's an illustration. It's called The King Has One More Move. There is a painting called Chess Players. It's a painting by a famous German painter named Moritz Retschk, which is hanging, which was hanging in an art gallery. It is a painting of the devil playing chess with a young man in a battle for his soul. And in between them to the back of the picture stands an angel. It is a guardian angel of the young man and he's watching the game and there's tears coming down the angel's eyes, the angel's cheeks because the devil is winning the game. The young man is sweating. The young man is grimacing. He's worried. He is scratching his head and he's wondering what to do. And the devil on the other side is grinning wickedly. The man finds his king cornered in a checkmate. Remember in chess, if you take out the king, you've won the game. And the devil knew that if he takes out the king out of this boy's life, he wins his soul. The boy is in a state of agony knowing that he has lost the game. The devil on the other side is grinning wickedly, thinking that he has made his final move to end the game. And it's all he's left is to claim the young man's soul. The angel on looking on is sad. He said, not just because the boy is losing the game or has lost the game, but because he's lost his precious soul also. The boy is lost for eternity. While this painting was being exhibited once in an, in an art gallery, an American chess master by the name of Paul Morphy was visiting the same art gallery with a friend of his. And as they walked through the room, they came across this painting. And because he was a chess player with a great passion for the game, the painting obviously caught his attention. And he looked at the picture and he studied it. And he looked at it for a long time. There was something about the picture that didn't add up in his mind. And he wanted to figure it out. His friend was quite bored by now and he moved on. But Paul Morphy stood and he watched the picture. And let me remind you about the picture. The picture was of a chess game. An angel was watching from behind. There was the devil on the one side playing. And the other side was a young man. And the devil was winning. And the devil was grinning. And the devil was waiting to take his soul. And the young man was losing. The young man was in agony. He knew that he'd lost the game. He'd lost his soul. And he'd lost to the devil himself. And Paul Morphy, the American chess master, watched this game. And he looked at it. And he scratched his head. Then he went forward and he went backward. And he looked at it again and again. And, he, and his eyes were fixed on the chessboard for a long, long time. He was fixed, fixated on this picture, watching it. And then suddenly, he excitedly shouted out. He exclaimed, I know what's wrong with the painting. The game is not over yet. His friend rushed over. The curator of the gallery heard the shouts and he was he ran there to find out what's going on. And together they asked him almost in chorus, what's wrong with the painting? And Paul Murphy, Murphy looked at them and he said, can't you see it? Can't you see it? The game is not yet over. Satan hasn't won yet. The king has one more move and it's the winning move. And today I want to tell you, as the Spirit of God comes over me and comes over you today, your game is not over. Maybe you're sitting across from Satan and you're playing for your life. And Satan is winning and he's looking at you and he's saying to you, the game is over. Give it up. Give it up. You're out of moves. There's nowhere to run. You're cornered. 
Your mind may be telling you, give it up, my friend, give it up. You're done for. You're tired. You're about to give up. You, some of you want to end your life today. Some of you find that there's no meaning to your life today. Some of you think, what is the purpose of me living day after day after day and nothing is happening? I have no purpose in this life. Where am I going to? What am I doing? I rather just give it all up and I rather give in to the devil and let him win the game. I have news to you for you today. You may be out of moves, but King Jesus, your King Jesus has one more move and it is the winning move. It is the winning move, but he cannot make a move until you turn the game over to him. You need to say those life changing words, your move King Jesus and wipe the smile off the devil's face today. It's up to you today. It's up to you today, my friend. It's up to you, my sister, my brother. You may be, your body may be wrecked with pain and sickness. You may be in financial difficulty right now. You have no moves. You move to the bank, the bank won't help you. You went to your friends, they won't help you. Your relatives won't help you. Your children won't help you. You might have a problem with sickness. You might have a problem with, with a habit or whatever it is. You're out of moves. You're out of moves. Your life is a checkmate. Today I want to tell you, I have news for you. King Jesus is still in the game. King Jesus is still in the game and he has one more move and it is the winning move. Wipe the smile off the devil's face today. Say these words, your move, King Jesus. I trust you have enjoyed God's word today. I pray that you will act on it and share it with others. Feel free to share the video and the audio. Remember to join us again on Wednesday at 7 p.m. same time place. And same time and same place. I'm looking forward to your company. This is Pastor Simon. And as always, it has been my pleasure. Till next time, God bless.